The largest fortress outside of Europe, Fort Penang was certainly an intimidating defense. But as we've learned, it did little to stop the invading Japanese army during World War II. Where I'm going next, however, was once a hastily dug-in trench city that held off the invaders for the first time since the start of the Japanese invasion. In December of 1941, Japan invaded British Malaya over land, bypassing coastal defenses such as Fort Penang. Making heavy use of bicycles, the Japanese blazed through the tropical jungles of Malaya, catching the British defenders off guard. I'm using the same transport and route of advance as the Japanese invaders, moving southwards from Penang. My destination is an unlikely British stronghold in the town of Kampar within the state of Perak. In the hills overlooking the town, 1,300 British troops created a trench defense that brought over 5,000 Japanese soldiers to a grinding halt. That battle is now known as the Battle of Kampar. Hidden on this hill are the remnants of a hastily dug-in fortification that held this important defense line against an enemy who had up to this point had been unstoppable. I'm going up to uncover this vicious battle and to see what it was like during those desperate times. Hello, Harchan. I meet up with Harchan Singh, an amateur historian dedicated to preserving this site as a World War II memorial. Known as Green Ridge, this is the only surviving remnant of the Kampar defense line. The Kampar Trench City spread across three ridges on top of the limestone mountain Gunung Bujang Malaka. Overlooking the main road to southern Malaya, the positions provided the perfect defense line against the Japanese pouring in from the north. Almost 4,000 civilians and British soldiers were responsible for constructing the trenches. Their tools were nothing more than picks and shovels. In just seven days, they created a defense system some two kilometers long. At the top of the ridge is the command trench that made up the very heart of the Kampar defense. Well, uh, the communication trenches are here. Ah, so this would have been the headquarters. Yes. This huge depression is actually a trench. I mean, look how massive it is. It's got to be at least 60 by 40 feet across. The command trench was the largest and most fortified position in the entire Kampar defense line. Up to 200 men would guard British commanders overseeing the battle. Leading from the command center was a network of linking trenches that provided supplies to other sectors. We go deeper into the jungle to locate remnants of this sprawling supply chain. The Allied forces store their ammunition around that area. So this is the place they will carry the ammunition, the equipment from here and supply it to their men at the, the main trench. On the north end, right? right? So coming up from the south end. That's right. I mean, now this is much, much deeper and you can still yes, get a sense right. of it. Right. Now, bear in mind, there's still got erosion and dirt and leaves, so I imagine it would have been a lot deeper than this and quite wide so you can easily yes. get two men side by side. Yes. Despite being hastily dug in fortifications, the Kampar trenches proved more than a match against the Japanese army. Over four days from 30th December 1941, the British claimed over 500 Japanese casualties. It was an unprecedented setback for the invaders. I decide to conduct a little experiment to find out how the British defenses could have been so successful. My test site was one of Kampar's most effective trenches. From this position, I can see that, one, we're obviously at a higher advantage so making it difficult for the Japanese to see us. 
And these machine guns would have been kind of sandwiched in between sandbags, right? That's right. So, let's say I'm coming from downhill upwards. First of all, you can see, all I can see is the tip of his helmet being exposed. And it's a very daunting because that machine gun could easily blow off my head. So a frontal assault would be a suicide mission. Now, this machine gun nest right here, kind of three quarters up this hill. Just up there on the flat area, we have the command center. So you can see that it was very important for this place to be heavily fortified, especially as we're approaching closer to the command center. The success of the British at the Battle of Kumpar did not turn the tide of the invasion. On February 15, 1942, the British surrendered in Singapore, beginning over three years of Japanese occupation in Malaysia. The victorious Japanese exploited Malaya heavily for its tin and rubber resources. Harchan brings me to a quiet village that was once part of the Japanese war effort. It's located near tin mines and hides the unrecorded remains of a Japanese arms factory built in 1942. So this chimney is still largely intact. Yeah. This particular chimney was used by the Japanese Imperial forces to manufacture the component or the carbide which is used for the bullets or the bombs. So here's the hole where the heat would have come up yes. to melt the carbide. The carbide chimney is not the only remnant of the old Japanese arms factory. A Japanese building still stands guard by the nearby river. This is a structure where the, the Japanese uh, soldiers were living. This is the bottom area, and the top area, there, they were building there. So this would have been yeah. two levels? That is two levels, okay. exactly. And this is the reinforced concrete? Yes. So very solidly Very built. solid. By looking at this uh, structure here, 40 meters by another 30 meters, it clearly figures that this could be uh, the headquarters uh, where the Japanese worked here and they monitor the process of the tin mining and also the chimney. The Japanese were not the only ones to exploit Malaysia's natural resources. For decades before, the British had already invested in Malaysia's tin mining and rubber industries. I'm about to come face to face with a mysterious castle built by one of Malaysia's foremost tin and rubber tycoons. Before the Japanese invasion of World War II, Malaysia was one of the British Empire's most prized colonies. I'm on my way to Ipoh to explore an enigmatic colonial mansion known as Kelly's Castle. Up until 1926, it was the home of tin and rubber tycoon William Kelly Smith. William Kelly Smith first arrived in Perak in 1890, just as rubber cultivation was being introduced. Smith began planting rubber trees and dabbled in the tin mining industry. By 1903, he had made a fortune and decided that he needed a home that could match his prestige. In 1915, William Kelly Smith's wife conceived their first son, to celebrate the new addition to their family and the success of his business, William Kelly Smith decided to build a castle like none other before in Malaysia. But that's when things started to go terribly wrong for him. 
Tragedy struck almost immediately at the start of the castle's construction, as a strain of Spanish flu spread from Europe, killing many of the workers. But Smith pushed on. To find out more about the castle's history, I'm meeting up with Tajuddin, who has curated Smith's home for five years. So this is probably the central courtyard? You're right. According to Tajuddin, the castle was really a 1915 expansion of Smith's original home from 1905. He envisioned his new place to be the hub of high society, boasting of the first ever elevator in all of Malaysia. To build the castle, Smith drafted workers from his rubber plantations. They came from India and clearly influenced the design of the building. About 70 Indian workers was used to build this uh, castle. So they have the Mongol... Uh, okay, here, the Mogul, see, Mongol uh, style of building. Yeah? Like the Taj Mahal. Exactly. Ah, okay. All right. Something uh, unique about this castle is that it was built not using any cement because cement was not available in Malaya then. These bricks were actually apricot bricks made locally. But what was used to plaster these bricks was actually a mixture of sand, uh -huh. chalk and duck's egg white. Actually, 